Mathematics has given us so much, so many insights into the world of numbers, deep understandings of the world around us, incredible everyday applications that have helped build modern day society. But for everything we know, there is so much more that we do not know. And some unsolved mathematical problems are so important or have frustrated us for so long, they earn a degree of fame in their own right. And on the 24th of May, 2000, excited by the heady promise of the new millennium, the American Clay Mathematics Institute published a list of seven famous unsolved mathematical ideas. The millennium problems, as they are known, represent some of the deepest ideas with which mathematicians have wrestled, in some cases for over a century, still without resolution. And if that's not enough to get your attention, they each carry a bounty of $1 million if you solve them. Let's start with the one millennium problem that has been solved, the Poincaré conjecture. At the beginning of the 20th century, Henri Poincaré asked a fundamental question in topology, the branch of mathematics that examines shapes in space. Topologically, a solid sphere is equivalent to a solid cube because a cube of plasticine can be remoulded into a sphere. Topology ignores the difference between a sharp and defined edge and a smoother curved surface. But a plasticine donut can only be made into a sphere by crushing it down and removing the hole, or cutting it and remoulding it. Or taking a sphere and pushing a new hole through it. Topologists see holes in objects as defining fundamentally different objects. So as far as they're concerned, donuts and spheres are topologically different. Now, if any topologists are watching strictly, I'm not distinguishing between a sphere and a ball, but hey, let's just keep that between us. Now, a donut and a coffee cup are topologically equivalent. Even though to the eyes of a non-topologist, they look completely different, to a topologist, they are just two solid objects each pierced by a single hole. Poincaré had an idea as to how we can think about spheres. He thought that if an object has no holes and is finite, it is topologically equivalent to a sphere. It's the sort of thing that in the case of three-dimensional objects that we can hold in our hands, it seems almost obvious. The cube can clearly be deformed into a sphere without tearing a hole in it. But there are two important things to note here. Firstly, to a mathematician, seems almost obvious, just doesn't cut it. And secondly, Poincaré made his conjecture about spheres in four dimensions. When it comes to higher dimensions, spheres in four dimensions, a seven dimensional donut, you might be a bit scared. You might even think, I'm gonna to have to tap out here. I'm not a brilliant mathematician. I, I can't picture higher dimensions. Well, don't worry. Shapes and surfaces in higher dimensions are impossible to picture in your mind. Don't sweat that. Even brilliant mathematicians can't do so. You might also think that while they are impossible to picture, surely it's easier to prove things about shapes in four dimensions than in five, and easier in five than in six and so on. Well, watch and learn. Because in 1961, American Steve Smale proved the version of Poincaré's conjecture for spheres in all dimensions six and above. But his method didn't work for the four dimensional spheres that Poincaré was thinking about, nor for objects in five dimensions. Then in 1982, another American, Michael Friedman, ticked five dimensional spheres off the list. So perhaps surprisingly, objects in just one dimension beyond what we can picture proved the most stubborn ones to succumb to Poincaré's conjecture. And so it remained for 20 years. But in late 2002, a paper appeared on the net proving a mathematical idea called Thurston's conjecture. And proof of Thurston's conjecture meant that the Poincaré conjecture had also been conquered. People were wary at the time because there'd been perhaps more failed proofs of this conjecture than almost any other mathematical idea. Yep, shake a tree in some cities and you almost felt a dodgy proof of the Poincaré conjecture would fall out. But the 2002 paper on Thurston's conjecture was remarkably deep. It took teams of experts hours and hours to wade through and confirm but eventually they agreed. The famous Poincaré conjecture had been proven. The, until then, pretty much unknown author, Russian Grigory Perelman, received one of the ultimate honors in mathematics, the Fields Medal for his efforts, and of course, the $1 million prize. But stunningly, he refused each of the awards. He will, however, be remembered forever as the first person to solve a clay millennium problem. 
Now, if you're keen for the $1 million yourself, there are still six problems up for grabs, but I'll be honest, they are tough nuts to crack. So tough that even explaining them in any level of mathematical depth is a real challenge for me as much as for you. But if you're ever at a dinner party and the conversation turns to the clay problems, here's a quick layperson's cheat sheet to the remaining six millennium problems and vaguely what they're about. Let's start with Yang Mills and Mass Gap. Woohoo! Quantum physics is the physics of the extremely small, an incredible world that seems to be governed by very different laws to that of our big world. Well, thanks to Chen Ning Yang and Robert L. Mills, Yang Mills theory helps us understand the way fundamental particles behave with incredible accuracy, but also it throws up some riddles. Quantum particles possess incredibly small positive mass, yet seem to travel at the speed of light and hence should be massless. If you can resolve this mass gap, one million big ones to you. Let's look at the Riemann hypothesis. Do you remember what a prime number is? Six is not prime because six is two times three, but seven is prime because seven is one times seven and can't be broken into any smaller chunks or factors. Hate to interrupt. Would you prefer uninterrupted indulgence? Head to findqualia.com to access the entire series by comedian, broadcaster, and mathematician Adam Spencer, completely ad-free. We've known for thousands of years that the primes go on forever, but when it comes to spotting patterns in this infinity of primes, well, they haven't given up their secrets easily. One thing we examine is how the primes are distributed. This table shows us how many primes there are for the first 10 counting numbers, the first 100, all the way up to the first 10 million, million, million of millions. Well, in 1859, German superbrain Bernhard Riemann suggested we could gain an insight into the distribution of the primes if we understood the behavior of an extension to this gorgeous function, the Riemann zeta function. But the number of solutions to this souped up version of this equation, like the primes themselves, is infinite. Riemann claimed that all the interesting solutions had something in common. So far, we've tested the first 10 trillion solutions and his hypothesis stands strong. And the reality is most mathematicians think the hypothesis is true. In fact, a lot of the mathematics being produced today has proceeded on that assumption. But a proof for all solutions is another thing altogether. It would make mathematicians sleep a little easier at night and would earn you a cool million dollars. The Navier-Stokes equation. There are few things simpler than the joy of watching milk and coffee mixed together in a morning brew. Unless you're a mathematician, in which case the equations governing the flow of these fluids is fascinating and incredibly complicated. In the 19th century, two of the coolest named mathematicians you're likely to come across today, Frenchman Claude Louis Navier and his Anglo-Irish colleague, George Gabriel Stokes, applied Newton's second law to the motions of fluids and came up with a series of equations that depending on your perspective, are either pure distilled beauty or eye-rolling, headache-inducing, strap yourself in for the ride stuff. To see which side of the fence you sit on, have a peek at this beauty, which particularly caught the eye of mathematicians. It won't surprise you to know that solving these equations has proven as difficult as the equations themselves are impactful on the eye of a non-mathematician. Governing everything from the flow of air over the wing of a jet to the milk in that morning coffee, despite existing for almost 200 years, we still do not know the answers to even the most fundamental questions. Do these equations only have one solution? Many or infinite? Can they even be solved more generally than just testing individual events? Crack this nut and reward yourself with a million dollars worth of coffee. And after that, we still have three thorny problems wherein even trying to explain what they are about will cause many people's eyes to just roll back in their heads. If this hypothetical dinner party takes a turn and someone asks you, well, what about the other three problems? I'd go with this. In 1971, Stephen Cook and Leonard Levin independently came up with the P versus NP problem. The Clay Mathematics website gives a great example of how to picture this problem, and here's my version of that. Say you ran a hotel with three rooms that could each hold two people, and six people came along to stay. And just as you were about to allocate the rooms, they said, oh, by the way, Jerry really doesn't want to stay in the same room as Rodrigo. Now you've been a hotel manager long enough to know not to ask any questions. Can you find an allocation of rooms that doesn't break that rule? 
Well, of course you can. There are many acceptable allocations and it isn't hard to find one that works. And also, given any random allocation of rooms, it's pretty easy to check if that allocation obeys the keep Jerry from Rodrigo rule. Just look down the list of rooms and make sure that Jerry and the R-Dog are not sharing. But imagine a much more complicated situation. Say your hotel has a single massive room that holds 100 people and 400 people turn up and they present you with a list of 300 pairs of people who can't share rooms with every person in the group involved in at least one pair. How long would it take you to allocate that room? It's still easy to check if any given group of 100 guests in the mega room is acceptable. Just read down the list of pairs to see if any of them occur in the 100 guests so chosen. But to generate an acceptable group of 100 seems incredibly hard. Is it? Well, to give you an insight into why it seems so hard to find an answer, the list of all possible groups of 100 guests that could go into that single massive room is 90 seven digits long, which if you've watched the video on massive numbers, you should recall is greater than the number of fundamental particles in the entire universe. So writing out the entire list of possibilities, well beyond what can be done. The P versus NP problem goes to the heart of the question. If a potential answer to a problem is easy to check, must the problem itself be easily solvable? Or can you have problems where it's easy to check any candidate answer, but incredibly hard to generate a correct answer? The Hodge conjecture. Scottish mathematician William Hodge made a powerful claim about the way we can understand the structure of mathematical objects called projective algebraic varieties. This projective variety is an example of what mathematicians call a twisted cubic. Isn't she a beauty? Hodge's conjecture has been proven for certain special cases, but when things get nasty, it hasn't been shown to be generally true. If someone can crack it, it will give mathematicians powerful new tools to understand complicated mathematical structures and net that person a cool $1 million, so get cracking. And finally, the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture. In 1965, two mathematicians at the University of Cambridge Computer Laboratory using a then state-of-the-art EDSAC II computer, look at it, isn't it gorgeous? Made a claim, initially based on graphs drawn by the EDSAC. Brian Birch and Peter Swinnerton Dyer believed they had an insight into the nature of points that lie on beautiful and powerful mathematical objects called elliptic curves. And whether they have a finite or infinite number of solutions within the set of rational numbers. Now again, this conjecture is supported by much experimental evidence, but that's a long way from an absolute proof. If you lay this claim to rest, you will give us a deep insight into the beautiful and important mathematical objects that are called elliptic curves, and ha ha ha, you'll get a million bucks.